and we're live. It is Thursday, March 9th, 2021. 2200 Zulu. Why do, you keep giving, why do you keep giving time in Zulu, Ben? Because I'm trying to live my values in advance of the debate with John Lovett on Friday. <laughs> oh, that's actually happening. It yeah, is happening. It's happening. Ben is quite happy about that. <laughs> Two o'clock p.m. Uh, UCLA and San Francisco time. Five p.m. Eastern time. Eleven p.m. Estonian time. And I have a big announcement to make, which some of you have noticed, some of you have not noticed, but uh, as of today. In lieu of fun, is no longer on Lawfare's uh, Crowdcast account. We have our own Crowdcast account. Um, we are all grown up. We have been officially spun off. We are no longer a cool little project that Lawfare uh, is allowing us to do <coughs> on their uh, uh, tech. We are using our own stuff. That means, Venmo, if you want to uh, sponsor, sponsor in fun, you can cut out Lawfare. You don't have to give John, Lawfare the, any... John, the, the joke here is, the joke here is that Venmo, I made a Venn diagram for, Ven, for Venmo, like the thing, just like a joke. And then they liked it so much and contacted me to see if I would do a number of other Venmo diagrams for them as part of an advertising <laughs> campaign. And then Ben got it into his head that this would be the sponsorship for hey, Animal Fun. Th they haven't said no. I didn't say no. I was excited about it. I was like, yeah, sure. We could have the Venmo sponsor. It would be like every day there'd be some Ben diagram. But anyways, that's the joke. Wow. Sorry. I like it. I like um, it. That's a good joke. So we are now independent not that we were dependent before but we were using lawfare's crowdcast account and this has exactly one piece of importance uh for y'all which is that if you watch lawfare live um uh and you watch in lieu of fun you should follow both the in lieu of fun accounts on crowdcast and the lawfare account so you get noticed for both um, and if you don't do that, uh, then you may not know about one or the other. Uh, other than that, it should have no impact on any of you. Uh, we are uh, not allowed to have fun anymore. Uh, but in lieu of fun, we are allowed to have my polymathic Brookings colleague, John Villasenor, who I got to know years ago because he did some pretty cool work on uh, drones and driverless cars. And, um, uh, and he wrote law review articles, even though he's an engineer, about policy uh, concerning uh, and, and uh, liability issues about driverless cars, which I thought was kind of cool. And now uh, we got an email from him the other day after John McWhorter appeared because he's also done some interesting work in linguistics. Um, and so we thought we would bring him on the show and uh, see where the conversation went. So, John, it's good to see your face. It is good to see uh, uh, you and Kate as well. Uh, congratulations on in lieu of fun and having established this this amazing um, thing you've got going with uh, all this incredible community of people engaging with, with people. So congratulations. Thanks. So yeah. um, how did you come to write up? You're not a linguist. I am um, not a linguist. Um, and yet you seem to have uh, done work um, in the field of linguistics or related to the field of linguistics. How did you do? How did you come to do this? No, so that's a great question, and and when I answer it, you'll realize it's not as far fetched as it might seem. And so let me start with engineering. So one of the the in the last century, one of the most interesting questions in engineering, or at least I don't want to say engineering generally, but but the the subset of engineering which I have done a lot of work in, which is communications technologies, digital information, moving information from one place to another, as you can imagine when this sort of technology started developing in you know the 
kind of the, the latter part of the first half of the, of the, 20, of the 20th century and then you know, through the rest of the 20th century and through today, people wanted to know how, how can you communicate things like voice and imagery across using electronic information, right? In other words, if you're going to take people's voices and turn it into ones and zeros or take pictures and turn it into ones and zeros, you know, how many ones and zeros do you need? And there's this whole branch of, I mean, I would, I think of it as a part of electrical engineering, you know, some other people may think of it as a part of applied mathematics or something, but there's, there's something called information theory, which is this fascinating discipline, which quantifies the amount of information in signals. It's an absolutely incredibly interesting thing. And I'll give you a quick example. It turns out that there is no information unless there is uncertainty. And if you want me to sort of give you an example, wait, 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 wait. You got to slow down and unpack that statement. What does that mean? I'm going to give you an example. I know he's going to. Yeah, I'm going to give you an example. If I tell you, I will pay, you know, if you pay me $1,000, I'm going to tell you whether the sun is going to rise tomorrow. Would you pay me the $1,000? Of course not, right? Because there's no uncertainty in that event, right? On the other hand, if I said, and I could do this without breaking any laws somehow, if I said, if you pay me $1,000, I'm going to tell you this, the closing price of every stock on NASDAQ you know, two days from now. Would you pay me the $1,000? Well, you might want to do that because that's, that's pretty valuable information. And the point being that, 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 you, know, that, the, that you can make it a numerical mathematical tie between sort of the, the kind of uncertainty in some sort of a probabilistic thing and the amount of information it's conveying. Let me give no, you another. Wait example. a minute. I'm not. I'm. I'm. I'm hung up on this. No, see, I. Lo I love this. I like. I'm so glad that you're. Can I give you one more example before you get hung up? Wait, no, 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 no. I just wanna. I, I just wanna query. He wants to test it's, it. It seems to me what you're saying is that the value of the information is higher in the face of the uncertainty, but, um, like, so if if I say. Um, you, you will, I will tell you whether the sun is going to rise tomorrow. You will say that val that information is not particularly valuable because I already know it. But yeah, if I say to you, you learn nothing if I told you that. If I tell um, you, Ben, the, the sun is going to rise tomorrow. You know nothing that you didn't already know. It's so you mean, so you mean the amount of new information. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, yeah, it's still it, a it, unit it, of information. Well, but it depends how you define information. If you define information in the sense that, I mean, the question is, did, was it is it information to you? Let me give you another example. Let's suppose we have a coin, and it's it always lands on heads. When we flip it, how much information does it does it give us? Zero, right? Because we know it's always going to land on heads. There's really no point in flipping that coin. Now let's consider a coin that's a fair coin lands on heads half the time and it lands on tails half the time. Well, there's a lot of uncertainty about what's going to happen until that coin lands. And now let's consider us a coin that lands on heads 90% of the time and tails 10% of the time. Well, that coin, you know, there is some information gained by flipping that coin, but there's less give information gained than flipping the fair coin because you, you could have guessed that it was going to be heads and been right 90% of the time. And so the, the, the amount of money you would pay to know what it's really going to land on is lower than the amount of money you would pay to know what it's really going to land on if it's a fair coin, if being right has some value to you, if that makes sense, right? All right. And so, I'd say, and so the reason I mention all this is you now the, the coin flip, it's got two values. It's got heads and tails. And now you can think about something like language. And you can say, and if I can measure the amount of information in a coin flip, which turns out to be, by the way, in a fair coin, there's, unsurprisingly, one bit of information, a zero or one, associated with each outcome, right? If in a coin that lands 90% of the time heads, there's actually less than one bit of information every time you flip that coin. You could, you could over a, a large number of co coin flips, you could convey the outcome of those large number of coin flips with less than one bit per coin flip. Okay. Okay, but um, you, let me just put yeah. this in terms that that maybe might break this down a little bit. One, I think that you need to clarify. I just want to clarify for people that when John is talking about information, he is not talking about things, other words that we sometimes are are synonymous with information, which is like facts or uh, right, right, or right. knowledge or like something. And I really sorry. I have we have to say that for this audience because you. have jumped into a kind of a conversation about information that was much more mathematical than like or dif differently defined than like the level like the level that we've been having right. rhetorically like this conversation so i want to say that second basically you're 
I think that maybe the comparison here that you you would like to make between the coin flip example is that roll uh, like compared to rolling a dice, which has six sides and is a fair die, that like that has a like you have more like maybe not i don't know you're giving me this this is always how i've understood this that like basically there is more less entropy in the binary choice of a coin flip and more entropy in the binary in like the in the like hexagonal choice of like of of a die and so that like that therefore the information flow is different does that make sense you're right Yeah, yeah because if you roll a die you can't convey the outcome of that process with one bit you can't Right, right. Because there's more than two possibilities, right. right? And you're absolutely right. right. You would, and you know, you couldn't even do it with two bits, right? right? Because again, there's six, but with three bits, you could, right? Yep. And so the the amount of information associated with one roll of the die is going to be somewhere between two and three bits, because that's how many bits it would take to, c- to convey it. So that's a great example. And so once you, once you sort of, you know, okay, a coin flip, you know, and I agree, it's, I'm not talking about, I don't know what conversations you've had about information more generally, but I'm talking in a very sort of basic mathematical sense. Now you think about, a die it has six outcomes right and if and a coin has two outcomes now let's go to language let's take the english language and um so your audience probably there's syllables and then there's phonemes so a phoneme is sort of you know the basic unit of sound so if i say if i say you know go that's a symbol single syllable but it has a g sound that's the g phoneme and it's got the o vowel sound and that's you know that's a separate thing so that particular word has a couple of phonemes put together but our, our it turns out it's fascinating it turns out that english i don't know the exact number but i think it's in the 40s in terms of the number of phonemes that i have in english and and most you know, there's 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 some variation but you know most languages have some number of phonemes so several dozen or so phonemes and so every you know anywhere from you know low teens and so maybe teens extreme cases maybe, i don't know maybe 50 60 but yeah there's no language that has 500 phonemes in it, right um, and and so the whole kind of um, the whole corpus of things that you can say with words verbally is constructed by just combining together these forty something phonemes and strings, right? And so then you can you can then ask the question from a sort of information theory standpoint: How much information is in this string of symbols that all of us put together every time we talk, and how might that differ? across different languages and and how can that be measured and it turns out that very few people over the decades have measured that um there's a the, the, we our paper was one of the ver- relative a handful very recently in 2019 in, in in a journal called science advances um a far more comprehensive study than the one we did got published and, and they did cite our study and so one of the things that's fascinating to me is a couple of things about this question first of all what is the rate at, in sort of bits per second that we actually communicate when we're having a conversation like this. You know, it's clearly more than one bit per second, and it's clearly less than, you know, one gigabit per second. But what is it, right? You know? And, and does it said, vary like, from language to language? I'll get to that in a second. I think it but does. I just uh, want to yeah. just point out, just sorry to interrupt again, but I just want to, like, kind of bring home, like, the big thing that you're kind of, that you're, like, what it is that you're, like, you're saying here. For people, the reason that it's important that you trans sorry, and this is because I literally teach like like this level of like bit signaling in my internet law class. Like the, this matters because you have to be able to take something like that seems you have to be able to code something that seems subjective or seems unable and like you can ba- break that into phonemes. Like language breaks into forty ish phonemes is what John's saying, and then from that you can basically map that onto certain like to like certain bits into code that basically allows it to be able to be measured or to like, or for some type of program to break it down to a level that it can then be run through another program and identified. And so like, that is like, this is like why this is a big deal as a theory is that no one had done that before and everything was just suppositional in theory and that that kind of quantitative analysis of being able to break language down to this mathematical level allowed us to do the type of work that's super exciting that John's about to talk about. Sorry. Yeah, and I, I, I'm, not, I'm not claiming to have invented this idea of information. No, no, yeah, yeah no, I know. I'm just trying but, to but, like, but, I just here's, that here's, most here's one of the questions that I was motivated. One, one of the questions I was motivated by in our paper, I asked, you know, if you want to say, you know, the tiger is charging, you know, look out for the tiger. 
why does that take on the order of a second to, to say and not one one hundredth of a second or not a hundred seconds, right? From an Especially because standpoint. it would be evolutionarily advantageous to be able to say quicker than quicker rather than slower. Well, up to a point, right? It certainly if it took you a hundred seconds to say the tiger is charging, well, you'd be selected away, right? It wouldn't work. <laughs> on the other hand, I don't think there's a lot of I don't think there's a lot of additional advantage to be able to convey that in one one thousandth of a second, right? Because if you look at the time scales over which a human being can react and start running or whatever, you know, whether you hear that message across this time span of, you know, a half a second or, you know, three quarters of a second probably doesn't make that much of a difference. In other words, there's not a big evolutionary advantage in getting that time down to one one hundredth of a second because, you know, it takes that minute. So, so one of the things I was interested in understanding is, you know, why is it, you know, because there's no, there's it's not it's not an accident that it takes about as long to say things like that as the quickest you could react and do something about it there's no advantage if we could all communicate 500 times as fast as we as as we can there would not be an evolutionary advantage conferred by that right and if we and if we took 500 times as long as we do to say things there would be a very distinct evolutionary disadvantage to doing that so it's not an accident that languages whatever they are have sort of evolved to communicate at sort of a relatively bounded range of rates. And let me also say something else that I, that because I, Van Asten, even German, I the, those, those <laughs> words are so fucking long. Well, okay. Let me, so Ben asked me a really important question, which is what, what, whether the rate differs across languages. And I said, I think it does, but I want to hasten to add that I am in no way suggesting that any one language is inferior or superior to any other language. I simply think that different languages make different trade-offs because when you, this is another thing we, we learn from engineering. When you're communicating, when you have a communication system, there's, there's efficiency, how fast it happens, and there's a, there, it's in tension with what you might call redundancy or reliability, right? And that's why when you have communication where reliability is really, really important, you're willing to take longer. So if you ever listen to the air traffic controllers, you know, they might say, you know, United Flight 123, you know, descend to flight level 250. And then the pilot responds, you know, United 123, descending to flight level 250, right? They use the time to say that, to say the thing twice because it's really important to get it right, right? Um, and so just like that in communication systems, in any communication system, you can spend more time saying something and then have more reliability in saying it, but you paid the price for saying more time. Or you can say it more efficiently, but you maybe had a little less reliability. And, you know, the sort of natural experiment of different languages developing, it stands to reason that different languages have sort of landed in, in perhaps slightly different spaces on that. The other thing I'll say is that different languages have exploited different um, attributes of the human, you know, you know, kind of vocal system. For example, Chinese, as you probably know, Mandarin Chinese has four distinct tones that are associated with each syllable. Right. So every time you say a syllable in Mandarin Chinese, you choose or, you know, you need to choose. You need to pick the right tone. Right. And the choice of tone conveys an extra two bits of information that is not present in, a, in an atonal language. Right. And so and, you know, it's, it's actually fascinating. Some languages have even more have even more tones. It's always a fun game to sort of ask, you know, can't. <clears throat> native Cantonese speakers, how many cones are there in Cantonese? And they sort of you know, disagree with each other. Like, is it seven? Is it, I mean, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's really complicated. But in Mandarin Chinese, um, it's, it's four. And so Mandarin has an advantage over a non-tonal language like English. And, I don't, and I, by the way, I, I want to emphasize that I don't, mean, I, don't say, I don't mean to say that tone means nothing. Like if you say to somebody, you're not coming, that obviously it means something different than you're not coming, right? You know, there's, you know it's not as if pitch But it's nothing. the same word. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Whereas, whereas you know the the the, the M A Ma in Pinyin, you know, can mother be said scolds in, you know, ma, the horse. Ma, ma, ma. There's, yeah. there's you know four different ways to say that, and it has different meanings. And so Chinese has a two bit per syllable advantage over a, a language like English in in terms of its efficiency, you know, in communication. You know, on the other hand, you know, uh, languages like Spanish have, of course, um, much more sort of complex grammars, you know, certainly uh, than both Chinese and English in terms of this matrix of tenses and, and you know, modes, you know, subjunctive and indicative and this past and this you know, present. And, and so, you know, at the cost of those matrices of ways of presenting information in a language like Spanish, you know, can convey, you know, things in, in, in a different way in some sense than English. And that's not better or worse at all. It's just, it's just different. And to me, it's fascinating to look 
across these different languages and see how just by chance over the millennia, these different languages have ended up with these different ways of conveying information. All right. So, so you got to give us the outcome. Who wins the race? What is the most efficient and the least efficient language? And critically, you know, are the more efficient languages more or less inflected? So we have at least two Finnish speakers I, on the on the um, on the in the Greek in the chat. course on a regular basis. Finnish is to uh, or a Finnish speaker and an Estonian speaker. Uh, these are two of, I believe, the most infl highly inflected languages in the world. Uh, you know, Russian has six cases. I think Estonian right. has 21 or something. It's like crazily inflected. Uh, does right. that give you more or less information per second than uh, than uh, a, a word order based language like English. Yeah, well, a couple and Tomas, of things. if I got if I got it wrong on the number of cases in Estonian, you'll, let me also uh, say that that yeah that once you'll, you you'll that, correct me once you measure the information per phoneme or information per syllable, you also have to convert that to a rate for bits per second. And so, the a couple of things I'd like to say. So first of all, in our study, when we measured this, we measured we looked at. Spanish, um, Castilian Spanish, we looked at um, uh, American English and Mandarin Chinese. And for those languages, we found in terms of bits per second, on average, rates of sort of between 60 and 90 something bits per second. Interestingly, there's I mentioned this other paper that just got published um, in 2019 by a set of researchers. Um, I think they were based out of CNRS in, in France, although they might have also, they, the, the names are Coupe, Coupe C-O-U-P-E with the accent. O A O H Agu. Um, um, <laughs> Agu, right. Um, Didio, D E D I U, and then Pellegrino. And they, they published, they, I think they studied um, something like, I think it was maybe 17 languages. And interestingly, they found about 40 bits per second, you know, on average, which, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty close, right? I mean, this was exactly in science. Like, I'm, putting in, the, I'm putting in the chat. It was in science yeah, magazine. Science like, advanced. it's not, it's like, you know, you might have heard of it. Um, it's a good yeah, journal. And, and, so, <laughs> and so, the, so you have these, you know, their, their study, which was broadly consistent with what, what, what our study found on a much smaller group of languages. And to me, that's just a fascinating result. It's a number that, as far as I know, hasn't, I mean, you think, you would think that, that we've had a digital ecosystem for half a century. And yet, there, it hasn't been easy to answer the question of how many bits per second of information are we conveying when we speak? This is a fundamentally important question. And so, you know, this work can help, you know, answer, answer those questions. And our particular work, we found, for example, and again, this, you know, you could criticize our methods. Our methods were not perfect. Our methods made some assumptions. And for example, our methods did not, um, our methods looked only at phonemes and the correlations between adjacent phonemes. But there are correlations across entire sentences that our that our analysis failed to capture so so it's 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 by definition imperfect you know but we found that spanish was um less efficient than english in terms of bits, bits per second but it has more redundancy it has more sort of error checking built into it so you know you might argue you know that would suggest i don't know if this is true that would suggest though, that if you're listening to a spanish conversation over a noisy kind of phone line for example you might be better able to sort of figure out what's being said than all else being equal listening to an equivalently noisy conversation in English, just because Spanish, at least as we looked at it, seemed to have a bit more redundancy built in. And again, it doesn't mean that Spanish is, is inferior or superior. It just means that it, that if we're right, we may not be right. If we're right, it's operating at a different kind of point in the kind of redundancy efficiency trade-off, as you wouldn't be surprised given the very the complexities of the kind of Latin, you know, the Romance languages and the grammar there. Granted, I'm reading just the introduction, the abstract of this paper, but it does seem that like the general consensus is that across 17 languages that it is roughly 39 bits per second um, yeah. in similar information rates. And so that like, I mean, I don't know whether they, what, I don't know what they, whether they relied on key values. I don't know how they did. Like, I don't, I haven't read the methodology. I don't know anything about like what's going on with this study, but it, like just as like a number, if what they're saying is that there isn't that much variation, that's interesting. I mean, that's well, really yeah. interesting. Like that's a very you, like, yeah, evolutionarily. There, it, yeah, oh, it, it, it is. I mean, for, first of all, in that paper, I don't know if you have the whole thing or just the object, but in that paper, they also have some tables um, where they actually do compare 
um, the information, um, you know, a rate yeah. across these languages. And, and there is there is a reasonable amount of variation. I think that 39, but but not a crazy amount of variation. Yeah, I like have it. Hold language. on. I'll share my screen. I just pulled up yeah. the thing that you're looking for. Sorry, not to be super dorky about this, but no, no, I'm no, kind of dorky it's, it's, about this. This is a super interesting topic, but but I what, what I what I what I think is amazing about about this result. Um, so this is, is, the, is that yeah yeah. Go ahead. Is this is this the is this the screen that you were thinking? Um, I was thinking actually. There's another chart there. I think it's Figure One, okay. which talks about um, the information rate in bits per second. And it's oh, got, okay, you're um, right. Uh, on the right, uh, on the right there, it's got a got a set of charts uh, of information rate, at least according to those authors, in bits per second. It's it's figure one, and okay. you can see for these seventeen oh, different languages. I, I missed that. Okay, I, sorry, you're right. I'm now I'm going to share my screen again. Sorry, I apologize. Uh, you see that? It's coming up now. There we go. Yeah, exactly. Okay, and it's a little hard to read, but if, okay, but if just for those, if it's, it's a little small, at least in my screens. But but there's a, um, you know, there's a, you know, I think it's there's a, it, I think the right half of this graph is intended to to depict, to depict, you know, information rate, and it's you know got a bunch of different languages there, and for each one of those, there's a, a bit of a histogram, and so you can see there, 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 of course, there are some variations there, um, but but also to your point, Kate. They're not huge variations. It's not as if there's one language which is, you know, 500 bits per second and another language which is, you know, six bits per second, right? They all seem to be sort of in the, you know, in the range of, you know, I don't know, call it, you know, sort of 30, 35-ish up to maybe 50 or 60. You know, it's, just, it's, it's, it's not a it's, – it's a pretty confined range, which – kind of makes sense right in other words you know you would think that the the kind well, of evolution so. otherwise we're going to have like a race war or something to say. <laughs> no I, I think yeah. i think the sort of evolutionary pressures you know again it's like if you think about how hard it, you know you can try you can try to talk try, you can try to talk really fast it's not that easy right and so the, it's well you it's, do it you know you you, you talk <laughs> really fast you do talk really fast i talk really fast i also know that, like i know a lot of people that like they I am talking fast on purpose now because I'm just trying to like screw with everyone. But basically that like you can like the other interesting thing about talking really fast is that it's one thing to talk really fast is totally another thing to be able to comprehend very fast. And so there's like that is actually like I think a very interesting difference um, between auditory like processing like and, right. and vocalization that is based on like meat, like basically like based on yeah, like. And, and like so like we can pro like I can listen to a podcast at two times speed. No one has to fit like no one has to be able to speak at two times speed physically, right. which would not really be that possible. But like I can listen to it two times speed and still be able to comprehend exactly everything you're right. saying. That's a that's a really good point. Is that you're that that we're more able if 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 I put it on two times speed, it's 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 a little harder to listen to it, but it's not nearly as hard as speaking twice as fast. Right. Right. Um. But anyway, right, so but I, 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 I want to ask an, another question about the plausibility of this constrained range uh, claim, because I'm I'm, you know, we're different languages have radically different numbers of words. Um, English, I think, has the most words of any language. I, you know, I'm skeptical about claims like that. I really am. Um, you know. I don't know. Why? I, go ahead. I don't, well, because, you know... I didn't think it was a disputed point. Well, okay, it's a, no, I don't think it's a disputed point. If, if what you're measuring are... If the question is, what are the total number of words you know, that exist in the language? I don't think, it, I don't think it's a, that much dispute. But I, would, but I think the more... To me, the more interesting thing is, you know, if you look at the 97% most used words, the stuff that almost everybody says, the 90, when, pick, pick your number, 99%, you know... You know, if you look at, um, you know, the, you know, of all the words you say over the course of a week, you know, you know, how many words do, you know, not, you did a histogram, you, I, I think you might find a lot less variation across languages. Well, so, that's yeah. an, that's an interesting argument, but I'm thinking of, of a language like, say, modern spoken Hebrew, which, you know, has a very small number of words. Um, because it is a revival of a, you know, of biblical Hebrew. Um, and I think the total number of Hebrew language roots is something 
just around 8,000. It's very small. So they borrow a lot of words. And the other thing they do is they construct words out of, you know, in this very uh, a sort of Academy Francais kind of way, right? Where they <laughs> just kind of build words out of other, you know, combinations of Hebrew roots. They're portmanteaus. This is a, is a totally inefficient. So you end up with these rather long words for right. things that you actually don't need a long word for, or in other languages wouldn't have them, or you end up building, uh, you know, colloquially creating sort of agglomerations of words to refer to things that are actually pretty simple um, and that other languages do much more efficiently. And my question is, is there any inverse correlation between the number of words in a language and the efficiency with which it communicates yeah, information. That's a great question. My answer, my guess would be no, and the answer is because the overwhelming majority of the things that we say don't stress vocabulary in any sort of you know um, you know put it this way: if you only knew two thousand words or three thousand words, um, you could probably have the overwhelming majority of the conversations that you have today with with little impediment. I may also say that English, is a, as you know, is a strange language because it's 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 got these duplications, right? You know, you know, it is a mix of you know, you know, for like think of to think of the word you know friendly. Well, we also have amicable, right? And the reason we have those two things is because we have you know words descended you know from sort of the the, the Romance languages and the infusion of French and you know from from everything that happened you know you know a thousand years ago, and then we've got sort of the Germanic you know, kind of side of, of English as well. So English sort of brings together two sort of strands of, of linguistic history in a, in a way that, you know, you know, French, you know, French, you know, French maybe, maybe doesn't. And so, um, you know, and I also think one of the reasons that you, people say, if you look at all, people say English has so many words, I think it's also you know, because English has been, you know, such a common language of, of publication and, um, you know, scientific publishing and, um, you know, for, for decades and decades. So when people, you know, identify, you know, new, you know, new anything, there's often an English word coined for it where there may not be, um, if the, if, you know, in a language where there isn't as much, you know, of this literature. So I think, I, you know, to me, the total number of words is less interesting to me than, you know, um, the, the, the 3,000 most commonly used words in, you know, and I think in all, almost all languages, I bet you know, if you knew 3,000 words and were totally comfortable with the grammar, you could probably have, all the conversations you need to have, you know, unless you're really talking about very specialized, you know, very specialized things. So I, I my guess is that the number of words is not, it, it doesn't really correlate with it. Um, and you know, getting back to Kate's earlier point, I, you know, that graph that she was showing, I just think it's fascinating that you have this sort of relatively narrow variations that it's quasi universal that humans seem to communicate in spoken language in the, in this, at this rate, which is roughly bounded in a pre pretty constrained range and that all of these languages which evolved presumably independently i mean not not that every language is independent but among the 17 languages in that group you know you could certainly argue that i don't know japanese and english you know evolved in, independently and so it's just you know it's just just absolutely fascinating that nonetheless we end up with with these commonalities and yet these differences as well i mean what are the what are the amazing things i'm sure many people in your audience have studied languages or native speakers of languages other than english and one of the amazing incredible things when you study another language is appreciating the sort of different ways that different spoken languages have sort of kind of you know ended up being constructed to convey information it's just, it's absolutely fascinating and right? the literal so, meaning like you recognize literal meaning in words that I think that like, so for example, I'm trying to think of something. I'm like, it'll occur to me after, of course, this is all over, but like something in English that like I say, and it's never occurred to me what the literal meaning of it is, but I use it all the time. And like when I'm in, when I'm in, when I was like, when I was like in France, like immersed in French and like taking all these French lessons, it was like, oh, okay. Like, oh, that's okay. So I have a word in my head that like means good or like means it means good but you don't say good in this context everyone always just says this like right, right which also means good but not in the way that you thought it was going to mean but that's what you say when you want to say good in answer to like 
do you need anything else from us today? At, like as your server exits the table or something like that. I don't right. know. Like, and that there's like kind of, there's so many things like that. And some of them are like, have like literal different translations, but there's, and this is actually what I think is fascinating about the, about the, the, the Mandarin example is that the tonalities do, and that they're expressed do clearly signal and give notice in kind of a legal sense of like exactly the tone. Like we don't have such, we don't have such like formal recognitions no. of tone and it creates a lot no. of confusion. Like you can read a transcript of something and you can listen to a tra you can listen to a recorded message and the like you could you could have actors read the exact same words written and have it mean two totally different things because we can't convey that tonality in oh, not yeah. only because if you strip out it. the tones yeah if you strip out the tones from chinese you you that's it's, it's not mandarin chinese anymore right i mean it's right. it's you know i know that, you know as you know as you know from your experience like you know some of the best, some of my best sort of awakenings about the complexity of, of English have been through the eyes of other people. I'll just get, tell you a, a, a really quick example. When I was, uh, I was in France and somebody was asking me, why is it that you say you get in a car, but on a plane in on, you know, I was like, or in line versus online. The, like, yeah. So and, like, and so, but yeah. It, yeah. But I realized that the in on thing is if you bend over, you get in it. And if you stay standing up, you get on a bus, you don't get in a bus. Right. Um, and then if, if somebody had like a like a little two seater two seater Cessna, you would never say you're going to get on that plane because that sort of implies that you're sort of straddling the top of it. You get in that plane because you're going to bend over to get it. You know, you get in a, a canoe. You don't get on a canoe, right? But you get on a cruise ship. You don't get in a cruise ship, right? And so it's, it's, it's a. I had never it had never occurred to me until thinking about it that way that the on in thing was actually do you bend over to sort of you know put yourself on that particular conveyance, right? Um, but you know, well, that's, so, just... that's so architectural. I mean, like, so like, that's so like physical, like that's such an interesting, that's such it an is. In yeah, it's like a fascinating, and like that one word, which is so close. Yeah. It's one yeah. letter off and just like, yeah, exactly. One phoneme and, 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 off. Yeah. Completely. Yeah. And, and so the, the measurement, I, I mentioned that because languages are just infinitely complex and the, the kind of measurements that we were doing, I think they're valuable. I think they make a contribution. The kind of measurements in the science advances paper that you just showed, I think they're they're extremely valuable. They're incredibly good. But 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 any such measurements, however well intentioned and however carefully they're done, they're going to fall far short of complex of, of capturing the just extraordinary complexity and these sort of multiple levels of kind of correlation and and these rule sets, right? That are sort of inherent in language. It's just such a complex thing that we do. Well, this is also why I wanted to highlight for people when you were, I was trying to break it down earlier when you were kind of, you went into the, like the information being conveyed in bits and everything else. The other reason that this is important, is not just this theoretical conversation we're kind of having about like, isn't this amazing? And isn't it crazy how much like, and how, like, there's something really important here, which is that like, we have in it like a very sophisticated speech recognition system that has been commercialized and came from, a, you know, in Siri or in Alexa, or right. in all of these various types of things. And like, there is a, there is an invisible element that when you get something out of a box, and it is just this thing that works, that you have, that you feel like you're in the Jetsons or something, that you think that this is just a thing that has existed, and that there's not really a very sophisticated knowledge of exactly how much work and kind of complex analysis and engineering has gone into something like reliable speech recognition. And that, oh, no, it's incredible. And every time it, and every time it fucking fails, like it, not just the speech recognition, but the, especially the visual recognition, because we're not even there yet. Like is like, I just feel like people have no idea how hard it is. Like they're just like, oh, this, it's, like it's this really is, hard. Yeah, that these which, are the things that people have which to raises do. the question of how the human brain transmits this information. Yes, it's kind <laughs> oh, of amazing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, it is so, amazing. it's a fucking miracle. So <laughs> you and I can sit here and shoot this information back and forth, and granted, it's only forty bits a second, but uh, you know, oh, it's. It's not that fast. On the other hand, our comprehension is near perfect. And you get a supercomputer on it. And well, maybe it'll be able to transcribe if I'm talking like this in very good English. But the moment I get a bit colloquial or, you know, you start injecting the wrong accent in there, they're going to lose a whole lot of content. And 
Um, I am curious for your thoughts on that. Like, we have this very efficient way of communicating brain to human brain to human brain, and there actually isn't, other than the written word, a more efficient way of communicating human brain to human brain. That's a great uh, way of putting it, Ben. I mean, the the human the written word is is well. There's quite, there's is, also emotion, right? I mean, you communicate when you smile, when you blush, when you frown. I mean, there's yeah, lot, but there's that's only a few bits. Yeah, you know, yeah, exactly. It's a, you know, you're, it's much less information than somebody who talks as fast. It's also as visual, you do. which we um, don't need to get into how difficult the bits problem is with visual right oh now. Oh gosh! But yeah, like, right. Yeah. So, but like, just imagine that it's not. Yeah, tone. and, and well, writing is, and writing, is like... a, writing is its own thing. You could argue it's one of the first technologies. I mean, not the first, but it's an early. Te- it is. It is in some sense a technology. There's a fascinating set of questions there. Yeah, I mean. Um, you know, I'm not sure how to, how, to, how to answer the question in the sense that, yeah, I mean, you know, you're right that we're able to sort of exchange information at this rate, which we might agree is, you know, 40 or 50 or whatever bits per second. Um, but it's it is. It, but let me let me put it another way. It is thanks to an extraordinary it's an extraordinary efficiency. Right. It's that's not that many bits. But look how much information per second we're able to sort of convey. Right. Um, you know, it's just, and I'll, let me also say that these questions are not only philosophically fascinating, they also have very practical consequences because when people back in the mid 1900s were designing, you know, things like communication systems, and we're still designing communication systems, you know, the, the question is, how many phone conversations can you fit on, you know, a cable that's going under the ocean, right? How many pictures can your iPhone store, right? Same question. And, you know, um, and now let me clarify that. We are not able with today's technology to compress information so that it is 100% efficiently compressed, literally only using the amount of bits. In fact, we're far off that. But we still are pretty good at it, right? I mean, you know, the, 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 the raw picture that you might take with your, with your iPhone or your smartphone takes a lot more bits than the, than the version that you can email to somebody, but still looks really good thanks to these compression techniques, which are des- developed using these same information theory methods that we were talking about at the beginning of the discussion. John, this is, sorry, before we go to questions, and I know that we have to, I'm just like, this is so fun. I haven't talked with anyone at this kind of like, with this type of intensity around this type of stuff since I was like, like, since like I was post-college and like working in like a cognitive science lab. And it's just like, it's, uh, it is, I don't know. It's like this is kind of super geeky and great, and like, and we haven't even gotten I, I into the policy implications that I I see all over the place in this. Oh, it's, it's fascinating stuff. Yeah, it's, yeah. yeah. Terry, the floor Hi. is yours. Um, my question is: What's the optimal age for communicating? If we think that children are particularly adept at learning languages, but we know that physiological and neurological development continues on until you're in your twenties, when are we good communicators? You know, that's, that is a great question. I claim no expertise at being able to answer that question. I mean, uh, or, or certainly no more expertise than, than anyone else on, on the call here. I mean, I think you're, you know, uh, you know obviously, if, 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 if you're too young, you haven't sort of mastered language yet, right? Um, you know, but I would like to think, maybe it's because I'm not that young myself, that it's an increasing curve, right? That, you, that you, know, I'm not, you know, I'm not less adept at communicating now than I was 20 years ago, and I perhaps have a broader base of experience to draw from in doing that. So I don't know. Um, but um, I it's, mean, a, it's a really interesting question. I was going to say what? that we should have Gideon Yaffe on, who is um, a good friend and a mentor, and he is at Yale Law School, but he is actually not a lawyer at all. But he studies the um, the age of culpability and kind of like he before that like kind of studied questions of like intent and like when intent like is like is at a present enough place in the brain to have like legal culpability. Um, but uh, he's actually, despite that that foregrounding, he is like so relatable and great and has a lot of like wonderful thoughts about like how we re- need to reassess like in children the levels that we like that we have built in normatively in these types of kind of in these types of ways that are based around an age of majority and an age of minority that make absolutely no sense to what we empirically know about the development of the brain or ability to assess not just assess language frankly but 
in his estimation, and I agree with it, is like to assess risk and like that you're just not at um, at a very high ability to assess risk, especially at an age that's basically like it, like basically the lowest point is like when you're in your teens and then going into your like mid 20s, you have a much higher ability to have like a like a like a substantial risk assessment. But anyways, hopefully we can have Gideon on at some point, but I would recommend him. Terry, what's your hypothesis about what the uh, max, the the uh, optimal age for communication is? I don't have a good one, um, it, but it seems like the mastery of language and the ability to deliver simple meaning that children have is a lot different than the ability to receive information and process it critically that you get later. Right, that and, some people never get. Right. I teach college students and language abilities vary quite a bit. And some people never get to that critical thinking ability to, to process language. So I'm guessing it's early 20s, but I feel like I've gotten a lot better in my 40s and 50s. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I got to say, I I think that I am much better at communicating both on the listening side and on the speaking side than I was 20 years ago. Mm. And I, I, I do think that you reach a, there is some point at which age starts to impair your ability to do both. Yeah. Um, but I do think it's other than that, it's an ascending curve. I think a lot of people just get better at it. And I, I would just add that I think that, you know, sometimes we don't appreciate the extraordinary difference in our our skills for listening versus our skills for speaking. And, and, and what I mean by that is, um, you know, you know, or, or, you know, you can read an incredible work of literature and understand it perfectly that there's no way you could write. <laughs> you're, just, you're just not as good at writing. You can listen to an incredible speech you know, that you, that you, at least that I could not, you know, make myself, you can, you know, it's not just speech. You can listen to an incredible pianist, you know, but you couldn't play the piano that way. And the sense, you know, so we're, we're able to sort of, you know, comprehend our aperture for comprehension is far broader than our sort of aperture for production. And again, nowhere is that better hammered home than when you're learning a second language. And if you're living in France, learning, learning French, you might find yourself extremely comfortable understanding French and yet feeling very awkward when you're speaking it and kind of hearing yourself and knowing that you don't sound nearly as good as the people that you're talking to. Or who you're talking I make to, this right? joke all the um, time. I can read and write French. I cannot speak it like at all. Like it's like a horrible thing to like listen it's, to. It's I mean, I try to do. Although so Camille Francois says your French is beautiful. No, but that's because I like made her dinner one night, and so there's like she <laughs> so she's was, being polite. She's being very sweet. <laughs> but if you think if you think about the four skills, like reading, writing, speaking, and listening, speaking is by you know is by the the production skills are harder, writing and speaking, and between the two, speaking is harder because you got to do it on the fly, right? Writing you can take the time and you can look things up and you can sit back and reflect on it, but speaking you're there, right? Um, and so that's just. That's the hardest thing. And there's a huge gulf, even in English, even in English, I am much better at listening than I am at speaking. I can listen to a much broader range of things and understand them than I can, you know, articulate myself. Yeah. Yeah. Ox I was actually, German. Sorry, the floor really is yours. Quickly, yeah. Sorry, really, really quickly. I just want to say like, it's so interesting that you say that because my partner and I were having this conversation. We were talking the other day. We we're like, like about being smart and smartness and how we, increasingly have found as we get older that we really value people who like really have everything like everything that i need to know like at the top of mind when i ask them a question versus being able to be like i will be able to come back and tell you about that later and some kind of like other type and it's like it's not wrong i'm never like upset but there's just like there is so much value to someone holding it all in their brain all at once and being able to tell tell you and like i'm now kind of like thinking now i'm like because of this conversation i'm thinking about it in bits and like how you kind of you're the the bit like you're like the size like you're like the size of your ram as you kind of like get older like maybe diminishes at some point maybe it gets bigger i don't know like there's all of these types of things um anyways i just that's a super interesting no point. i mean yeah there's a whole an inquiry it would be amazing to know you know how much information is in your brain right how could because it's it's not infinite it can't be infinite right no it it's can't enormous be. 
but it's not infinite. And, and, you know, how does it work when you, I don't know, you, where you, where a memory gets jogged. I mean, we, uh, uh, I know we have a question, just a couple of weeks ago, I was like sleeping. And for some reason, in the middle of the night, I woke up and I remembered this toy that I had had when I was like four. I hadn't thought about it since I was four. And, but why did that happen? You know, I mean, it's just, you know, but it was in there somewhere and, and stored in some physical, tangible form and something happened that's got to nudge it. And it's just, it's, you know, the human brain, you know, you, I'm sure you can the find The human brain is like you know, the, like the Raiders of the Lost Ark and like that final like thing when they're like wheeling everything <laughs> the giant into, warehouse like, into the warehouse and the crates and you're like, oh, fuck. Like no one's ever going to open that arc again. <laughs> All right, you guys, we got Sorry. some questions lined up. Ox, right. the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, man. <laughs> um, sorry, sorry, I can't come on video. My laptop sucked to too many things. Um, it's okay. But... It cre increases your air of mystery that you're, <laughs> you've got a name that nobody can figure out what it means, and you're a black rectangle. So we're going to make you the full screen, one, and the floor is yours. One bit. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's a zero. It's a hex. Uh, anyways, oh, um, <laughs> so this is a bit of a selfish question. I'm a software engineer, and every time some big hack gets discussed in the media, a lot of like the punditry around it gets me super annoyed. And that's caused me to think about how we as engineers need to talk to the policy or law communities. Um, so could you possibly discuss, like, you know, you wrote a law review article for an audience of lawyers, but you're an engineer. What was it like to bridge those worlds? And like, how did you have to change how the way you normally write in order to write to that other community? You know, I, well, that's a wait, great before John before, before John answers this question, I just want to say there is a, a little thing you should know, which is that John knows a shitload of law, and so um, uh, the first the first thing that's interesting about John's uh, uh, um, uh, article, I forget where it was published, his, his law review article on, on liability regimes for, uh, for uh, self-driving cars is that it's, uh, it's got a lot of tort law in it. And um, that's not an engineer writing about engineering for lawyers. It's actually someone who studied the language of, of the relevant law writing about engineering for lawyers. And so the first the first thing which John it may be too self-effacing to say is that he learned a lot of law. But John, with that as a as well, I, I, yeah, a no, I, puffery I, I, I for you, uh, uh, how would you answer the question? I mean, I, no, I appreciate I appreciate your your points. I, I think it's you know people talk the talk about interdisciplinary work all the time, um, and I think there's a huge opportunity and importance that we should place on really reaching across disciplines and. You know, there's many good things, many extraordinary things about American higher education. But one of the things I think is not so extraordinary is that disciplines are still very vertically siloed, right? You still have this, you know, you, you, know, you, you, you know, the engineers, you know, still think that if you're in it, you know, the real place to be is engineering. And, you know, the economists think that, you know, you know, the real scholars are economists and, you know, the political. Oh, scholars, I actually and, think the real scholar, like the real economists think they're all mathematicians. But yes, fair enough. <laughs> But I, but but and so I think some of the most pressing societal problems we have are ones that are not going to be solved by people who are speaking only the language of the particular discipline. That can <laughs> up to. And 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 that doesn't mean that I think that I'm going to walk in there and solve digital privacy just because I learned some law. But I do think that that we have to do the homework, the real work of really kind of jumping into sort of re relevant adjacent domains or other domains and, and really learning that. I would also say that I would say there's an asymmetry between law and engineering. I think in law, there has long been a recognition of the importance of technology law and a respect for the fact that any good law, as some people who are going to be looking at technology law. In engineering, unfortunately, it is still extremely unusual to have engineering faculty members at universities who are actually doing law. It's just the the culture of engineering schools is is in that sense less kind of open to sort of that sort of interdisciplinary work. And and I and you know that's a bad thing, but it also created what what amounts to sort of a market opportunity for someone like me who wanted to actually go into that space. And you know now I do have a position on the UCLA Law School. School of Law faculty, and I teach 
a constitutional law and technology class there. And, and to me, that's been, you know, very rewarding and also just a great opportunity to sort of, you know, work across domains. Um, but it takes, as you know, as Ben, ben put it, you know, kindly, but yeah, it takes a lot of work um, and working with people who know a lot more than I do um, to sort of, you know, get up to speed on some of those things. Mike Tolhurst, whose uh, face will also <laughs> remain hidden without even a black rectangle. Hi, just a good to get us join real quick here. I had a question, John, as a as an engineer. Um, I was wondering how do natural human languages compare to artificial languages in terms of information density and in terms of the features that constrain their development? Because it seems robots are different than people. Yeah, I'm going to answer it with a quick I don't know, um, because I, I, I haven't done that. Um, you know, I, I would also, you know, the question, I guess, part of the question is sort of what do you mean by an artificial language, right? Because that could mean a bunch of different things. And, you know, some artificial languages are sort of highly constrained and they're only intended to sort of do a few things. Other, other artificial languages are more broad. Um, but I would guess that human languages on balance are far more sophisticated. Um, you know, human languages are the product of, depending how you count it, you know, hundreds of thousands. Um, and actually, we don't know, of course, when humans started speaking, but let's assume it's some number of hundreds of thousands of years or tens of, it's, it's a long time ago. <laughs> However, whatever the answer is, it's a long time ago. And it's, it's, had, it's been optimized over just these extraordinary time scales to sort of, you know, there's, there's an awful lot that we do with language. And so I would imagine it has adapted and evolved to encompass far more capabilities than even the most sophisticated artificial languages. But I could, I could be wrong. I could be wrong about that. That's just my feeling. It's a, it's a great question. This, it's a really interesting question. It's a fascinating question. I want to add to your other to the other question before um, the one that was kind of uh, oh god, I got distracted by the fact that I couldn't speak and now I can't remember what I was I was going to say and then it just like it's because Mike Godwin showed up and you you had an oh, almost you had an irrepressible god. urge to it's, say it's you Hitler. Nazi, yeah. It's 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 in your brain somewhere. I know. Um, I know that because you told me, but there is also, but there is, uh, no, God, ah, God, it's like, see, this is why I think I'm getting old. And then I message all of my friends who are cognitive neuroscientists and they're like, no, no, you're fine. And I'm like, are you sure? And they're like, I think, I think you're fine. (laughs) I I think you're probably getting old, but, um, but as someone who's much older, um, (laughs) you know, it is true that you are getting older at a continuous rate. Uh, while Kate is remembering that's her a, question, how fast you're going, by the way, Mike Godwin. The whole relativity the f- thing, like you know, if you're like in, in orbit <laughs> around the Earth, you know. that's exactly. Mike Godwin, the floor is yours. Yeah, uh, I'm so glad you brought up. I'm so glad you decided to talk about information theory today because I was telling people in the chat that more than 40 years ago, I wrote my senior thesis on uh, on, on on Claude Shannon and information theory in, in the novels of Thomas Pynchon which is like, I wrote this thesis that no one will ever read, but it was my honors thesis. And I'm so proud that I still have, I still recognize that stuff. What it was, uh, oh yeah, see, in Gravity's Rainbow too, uh, there's a big connection between uh, information theory and thermodynamics and entropy, but we haven't had a chance to talk about that today. But my real question is really about uh, Sino Weibo, uh, you know, about Chinese Twitter. one of the things that I've been really interested in, but I don't have any firsthand information about it, maybe nobody here does, is that it's been easier for Chinese users of the, of, of the Twitter equivalent to be able to engage in elusive political expression uh, through the microblogging services in Chinese. I've heard that, but I wondered if you had heard anything about that, John. Uh, and the theory is that because of the way you're you're dealing with uh, Chinese characters, you're able to get more information in the bandwidth. I don't know. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know specifically about that, although I would imagine just you know, language aside, if, if you've grown up in a country like China where you, know, um, you don't have the same freedom to discuss things that you have here, that, that you become skilled at sort of you know, edging around topics. And, and so that might be a product of the, just the, the socio-political system that's there. I don't know. Is there, a good question. Is there any, um, I mean, analog, analogy to the study that you guys have done in written languages? Because it does seem like the written language variation in efficiency should be much greater 
than the spoken there, language. There has been a bunch more work in written language. And the reason why is because written language, by definition, the symbols are handed to you, right? In the English alphabet, you know, this is the alphabet, right? In Japanese, you've got, you know, the hiragana, katakana, and the, and the kanji, but you've got a, you've got a, a there's a, a, a set of, you, you don't have to sort of have, have the initial discussion of what are, what are the symbols? You know, it, it, with, with spoken language, we say, well, should it, be, should it be syllables? Should it be phonemes? By the way, that science paper that, that Kate had up on the screen, they use syllables and not phonemes, and they had some good arguments for doing that, which we could get into if we had more time, which I know we don't. Um, but, um, you know, but I think written, lang yeah, written language has been very, very extensively studied because it is in some sense the lower hanging fruit. Um, and so, in fact, uh, the, uh, these, you know, these kind of uh, zip technologies where you can kind of take a file and zip it up. And if it's like a, you know, it's got text in it, you know, it can, it, it uses sort of the, you know, the, the, the entropy information about the, the symbols. So that, that's been far more well studied just because it's, um, it's, you know, you don't have the kind of initial step of, the, of, of having to figure out what you're going to, what you're going to call a symbol. Cause you know, a letter is a symbol, right? You can go from there. So it's been much more studied. So I just want to say that I remembered my question. It wasn't a question, it was more of a comment. <laughs> and it was about, like, it was related to um, the, your kind of commentary about interdisciplinary work and the importance of it right now uh, and how much that speaks to me, like, personally in the work that I do, obviously. I mean, maybe not obviously, but, like, it's like I think of my le my work as very, like, kind of tech or engineering-based it's not, it, I don't get to do the fun cognitive stuff that I would like to do, but it's still kind of in the background. Um, but like Bruce Schneier, who is a cybersecurity expert and like kind of like the godfather of all of this stuff, like had this wonderful talk that he gave. Um, and I like to like use this quote, but he's like, technologists need to understand, like engineers need to understand that they're capable of building worlds. And uh, policymakers need to understand that technologists are capable of building worlds. So it's like this this idea that like neither side recognizes that they're creating or like that they're creating this entire thing and everything that they're doing is implicating each other. Um, and I and that, you know, and that like building a world implicates policy and that Oh yeah. And that pol and that like and that of course policy is going to be built on building a world, but you just can't you simply can't do it one without the other. And so right. I think that being like I feel like you, I, others are humbly in like kind of sometimes a business of translation between right. these, these industries. And, and, and unfortunately, and, you know, maybe people will disagree. I think that most engineering curricula at most universities are still too far too narrowly focused. They are, they do not spend nearly enough time teaching people, you know, um, all of these other things, you know, to sort of take a more holistic view of, about the, the, the broader societal consequences of the technologies. That it's all creating. just about building stuff, not the consequences of the building. I mean, they, you know, schools to a, ver to a varying amount of, to, to differing degrees give, you know, do pay some attention to that. And some schools do a great job of it, but by and large, I mean, the, because the problem is with, with engineering curricula, it, they're already pretty packed. And so if you, you know, if you want to add a technology and society course, the problem is, well, what are you going to take away? Because, you know, and then, you know, there's the, the person who's been teaching the, you know, the antennas course for three decades and says, and he's not going to give it up. Yeah. You can't call yourself an electrical engineer if you haven't taken, you know, my antennas course. And, yep. you know, um, and, and so, um, so it's, it, the, that's, that's, <laughs> the, that, that's and Ben's the, like, you know, who else has antenna bugs, Ben, what happened to your finger? That's a, that's a KK I mistake. cut my finger on a bandsaw today, <gasps> but I, I oh do want to say the bandsaw was not on when I did it. I was changing <laughs> the blade. Um, it was unplugged. In that's, fact, that's I sound, moved the blade scary. and the blade blade snapped. As I was taking it off and whipped around and cut my finger, oh, I'm so sorry it is a minor that. scrape. Um, wow! We are going to leave it there. <laughs> okay. John Villasenor, when you when I saw on the calendar that you were going to be on here, I thought we were going to be talking about uh, 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 self driving cars. I thought we were going to be talking about the FAA and drones. Maybe a little bit of privacy. Wasn't thinking linguistics. This has been a great I pleasure. So You're a great, great American. Uh, and you should come back, talk about other stuff soon. 
Um, happy, happy to come back. Thanks so much to both of you, and thanks, to, thanks to your to your audience for for listening to us. Uh, yeah, and, and for no, engaging. John, thank this you. was so fun. Thank you. I mean, we, you really should. You have to come back on because I don't know anything about the side of you that's been working on drones and like and um, automate automated vehicles. If I had, if, if I, I would say, if I could pick, and you, were, I was going to come back on. I would talk about the the ways to combat algorithm driven discrimination. Ooh, um, let's do that. Oh, we should totally that, do that. Let's get you know, that out just for like this, a week the rate, the, you know, ra racial and other forms of discrimination that occur. In, you know, I just published some things about the Fair Housing Act and algorithms used in housing decisions. And Fair oh, Housing let's, Act. Ah, let's no, no, let's <laughs> totally do that. Um, so, and it's actually it's that. a great subject. And uh, uh, let's bring you back next week for it. Happy to come back. Yeah. All right. Um, Tomorrow on the show, we have Christine Enba of the Washington Post, uh, whom I have never met before, but have uh, enjoyed her work and, um, and I'm excited to meet her. Uh, and then Thursday, I think we still have an open slot and Friday is the big debate over the nature of time with John Lovett, who has agreed to give us 20 <laughs> minutes on Friday. He will not be staying he's for the whole hour. He's not compromised on the nature of time. He just, he will, he's like, not compromising like, on the, the amount of time. The John Lovett is he doesn't have a lot of it. And so, yeah. so his his scheduler has told me he can give us 20 minutes. So he will wow. be here at the top of the hour uh, on Friday um, to be hurled to the ground bodily by me in an argument um, uh, over uh, whether we should have... It's going to take a lot of bits, Ben, to like... I'm, I am rearing to go. Uh, all We're all going to set our watches to Zulu time after that? Oh, uh, I, I try to always talk in Zulu time. And, you know, it's amazing how often... People understand Have what you're no talking idea about. What the fuck you're talking about? <laughs> Greenwich Mean Time, twenty-two I don't know what hours. That means either. So it means you go to where Christopher Argerus is and you say, "What time is it?" And that's the that time everywhere in the fair. world. Yeah, seems seems fair. <laughs> That'll be twenty-two hours and fifty-three minutes from now. And until then, 